Okay. So Christina Christilion is a licensed marriage and family therapist whose career began as working for a nonprofit hotline and proceeded to work in many mental health settings, including community mental health, outpatient, psychiatric, and now private practice. Christina migrated to the U.S. from Colombia at the age of four. Obstacles throughout her childhood fueled her focus on education and helping others. She graduated from Cal State University Fullerton with a bachelor's degree in human services, mental health, with a mental health emphasis. During the course of her undergrad, she had the privilege of working with professors and cohorts of life, where she led and facilitated peer support groups. Not long after this experience, she made the decision to continue her education at CSUF, where she received her Master's of Science in Counseling, Marriage, and Family Therapy. Christina is currently a licensed practitioner. Um, and now that we have one more student, can you say your name and your major and what you see as a positive um, of seeking therapy or going to a therapist? And then you can get food inside. <laughs> 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 okay. uh, um, yes. I'm uh, majoring in health science. I'm interested in physical therapy because I like to help people and I feel like it will be like something out of life. I end up liking um, helping uh, in, like a rehab, uh, helping get get better like, emotionally and physically. And let's do a round of applause to Christina. Thank you so much for coming. All right. Um, so I used to start? Yes. All right. So you guys heard a little bit about me. I was here for my undergrad and also did my master's in counseling here. So a double alumni, and I really love this school. And it's very nice to be here. So thanks for having me. Um, so. Basically, let me talk a little bit about being a, a licensed nurse and a therapist. The requirement for that is, um, for the most part, getting a degree, a master's or a doctoral program that's in counseling or psychology. Once you get that, then you can go towards your licensure, which most folks do in order to become licensed. Some people may not, and but that just means you'll always work under a supervisor. Um, but for most people, the goal is to become licensed. That way you can be a, your own independent contractor for um, 99 and work for yourself if you want to do private practice because there's kind of different things. Um, so the process of getting licensed is a bit cumbersome. Uh, so you'll get your master's and then you have to, and while you're doing your master's, you start a trainingship and once you start doing hours and working in clinical settings. Um, once you graduate, you're able to apply for an intern number through the state of California. So all of this is done through the Board of Behavioral Sciences to um, basically work on accruing hours. You have to get 3,000, which I think is pretty similar to social work. Um, and then uh, that those are face-to-face -face hours along with supervised hours that you're doing. And then um, you're taking an examination. So there's usually two parts of them, um, law ethics and then a clinical one. Uh, all in all, I would say it took me about seven years to do everything all together. Um, the masters, the hours, the licensing process. Um, so far, it's been very well worth it. I would say for you girls, maybe in particular, since you're going into a helping profession, um, that there will be components that are very much related to counseling that you guys want to learn. You're going to deal with people who are in pain, struggling, and have stressors, and um, so it'll very much relate in a lot of ways. Now, as far as my trajectory, a little bit is in is in my bio, but I'll give you a little more feedback as to maybe why I chose to do this path. Um, I came here when I was four with my family in Colombia. We were playing a tough situation there because I'm from Medellin, which you guys probably heard of the drug cartel and Pablo Escobar and all that. So that was in my hometown. Um, pretty close to where I lived, a lot of stuff was going on. It was pretty dangerous, and I think my parents just wanted to find more opportunity for my sister and I. So um, the process of being here was tough. Um, I had my parents shortly split thereafter, so it was my mom, my sister, and I. And my childhood was rough for many factors. Because of that, I would say um, 
dealt with a lot of issues related to being an immigrant, related to um, poverty and struggling financially, related to issues in the public and the family. Um, and I think all of those things, I guess during that path, understanding the struggle that people may go through and having struggles myself emotionally and externally, um, there were folks that kind of helped us along the way be it like a local church, um, be it someone giving me tutoring um, to help me learn to all the things that they were doing out of the goodness in their hearts. Um, I really appreciated that and always held on to that. So when I went into school, I always knew I wanted to be in a helping profession. So like some of you guys would probably just have that in mind and then you're going to narrow down to what you want to do. Um, I knew I wanted to help people. So for me, when I chose my undergrad in human services, it was either going to go into social work or becoming a counselor. I think I went more towards the counseling because I'm really interested in psychology and human behavior and why we do what we do. I think we're very complex creatures. Um, so for the most part, I think um, that kind of changed my idea and my focus. And so I wanted to go specifically into counseling. When I was doing my undergrad here, there's a course called um, Character and Conflict. Some of you guys probably heard about. Um, it's pretty infamous and I think when people take character conflict, a lot of people end up choosing to become counselors. A lot of my friends that I met in that course and doing work there, uh, they're all counselors now. And uh, this is a course through human services that basically makes you do almost like group therapy. It's not group therapy because this is a campus <laughs> and it's not supposed to be really had, but it, for the most part it is. Most of the class will be there's some sort of prompt um, talking about life and psychology and then you get into groups and then you process with your, your fellow peers. And so for me, I really enjoyed being a part of it as a student, and then I ended up um, running groups for like a year and a half after that for the course itself. And so that really um, triggered my love for psychology, in particular doing groups, which I um, have done a lot of since then. So I became licensed um, Two years ago now, I think. Um, since then, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of the trajectory of the settings that I've been in. When I started my traineeship, when I was still here in school, I was working at uh, a community center in Tustin that helps families and with low income counseling. So, with whatever they can afford or free counseling, and so with individuals, mostly families, and things like kids. I also did a little bit of work at the Tustin Unified School District um, at one of their schools doing K through six which was really neat. Um, and then from there, it's kind of a lot more. So from there, I would say I went into um, still community-based counseling. This was at the point in time in which I was an intern. So I had graduated by then. I had graduated and moved out to the LA area. I was in North Hollywood and I was doing community work. So there's a program called um, Victims of Crime. And this program helps anyone who's been a victim of a crime in the state of California. So as long as they're in police report, they get free therapy for a year. A lot of um, people don't know about this program. Um, usually they'll hear about it through police officers when they get traumatic. So the work I was doing there um, was really difficult. And uh, I think it was a really good crash course in an array of counseling settings and modalities. I worked with kids from three years old all the way till um, folks in their 70s and 80s. I did groups there. I did trauma groups for the kids. I also did trauma groups for adults. I did battered intervention groups for men who perpetrate domestic violence um, cases. That was very interesting. Um, and then a lot of individual counseling with kids and adults. And so during that time, um, it was a lot of trauma based work, which was difficult but also rewarding in the sense that I would learn to attend. This all prepared me for my licensing. Um, I ended up thereafter in another setting um, at College Hospital doing psychiatric work. Still doing my internship, still doing my hours. I ended up completing my hours while I was there, and I worked there for about five years. And this is, um, so I don't know how much you guys know about the mental health kind of structure, I would say. Basically, there's counseling, which is kind of like the low tier of Necessity per se, um, which is counseling that you attend once a week, every other week, whatever it may be. For folks who are more severe in their symptomology and probably are suffering with chronic mental illness, they end up going into like outpatient centers and or getting inpatient hospitalized. So there's psychiatric hospitals and all of that. 
So I worked with the psychiatric hospital called College Hospital, and we did um, outpatient work, uh, seeing folks usually after a suicide attempt or a psychotic break. So they were probably having maybe their first psychotic break, or maybe after multiple. A lot of folks dealing with um, schizophrenia, like mood disorder, schizoaffective, um, major depression. So again, a lot of trauma work as well, but it was specifically psychiatric. We used more of a medical model, and we worked alongside with the doctors and the nurses, and so I learned a lot, and I really, really enjoyed it. I think I felt like I found my niche. I really do enjoy severely mentally ill individuals. I it was the most um, experience I think I've ever had. It really taught me about the breadth of the health the severity um, and fragility of mind and all these stressors that people go through. A lot of the people were really low income or homeless. And so, um, again, a lot of learning, which I think is the point of doing hours when you go through your licensure is to get an experience and you can kind of get an array of experiences and understanding of what mental health in general or even social work and other, other licenses, um, what you can get with that. And so for me, I really enjoyed that experience. I was there for some time, and then I most recently went into private practice two years ago. So I currently work at a private practice in the city of Arcadia. Um, private practice is very neat because you get a lot of freedom. You, uh, once you're licensed, it's nice. You don't have to report to anybody. It's scary at the same time because it's all up to you. If you mess up or something is not done legally or ethically, you lose your license. Um, so it's really severe in that sense, but it's also very nice in the sense that as long as you're responsible and doing what you need to do um, and adhering to things you need to do, you get a lot of liberty and you can make your own schedule if you're really flexible with that. Um, that is one reason why I was able to leave psychiatric, even though I loved it, because private practice is needed in that sense, that there is flexibility and I can make my own schedule and all these things that are the perks of becoming licensed. Um, so again, when I was talking earlier about People can get their master's um, and then not do their licensure. That's an option, but doing the licensure is just, it gives you so much more freedom. Um, also, the pay is different as well. So, doing private practice um, has been really, I do individual work. I still, from time to time, do group work at a hospital, West Virginia, um, with severely mentally ill clientele, um, because I still really enjoy that and haven't really wanted to let it go. But, um, I, again, see a range from kids to adults, and I do a lot of individual therapy, and I see folks that want to leave, or they leave, sometimes once a month when they're doing better, um, and that ranges in the spectrum. You guys kind of did the icebreaker talking about um, the necessity for mental health, and I think the field in general that kind of goes into what you guys will also be doing, um, the health science, I would say that there are a lot of people in need physically and mentally. That will never end. The work will always be there. Um, and what I was explaining to Aaron earlier is like the work is actually way more than even ever before because of the climate of society and a lot of issues going on. So um, just being aware of that in life, there always needs to be support systems um, and having things in place to help people out. For instance, someone gets hurt, they break their arm. You wouldn't tell them not to go to the emergency room, right? First thing you would say is go to the hospital. Get medication, see a doctor, take care of yourself. Um, but funny enough, we don't do that for mental health. Uh, we don't tell people, you know, check in with how you feel, and if you're not feeling well, really go see somebody and nurture yourself and love yourself. And um, we we tend to see them very different. And there's a big stigma with mental health. You guys will run into a lot of folks that are also comorbid, so they're dealing with physical ailments, but also most definitely mental. They usually go hand in hand. People. Um, have a tough time dealing with stressors, and especially physical stressors. You think about maybe folks who have lost their mobility or their ability to function and going through different life stages and grieving that. And so in many ways, you guys are going to really be in line with the counseling aspect of all of this and have a lot of patience and hopefully empathy and compassion and understanding. Um, the question earlier about the necessity for, for mental health and why it's good to seek counseling. For me, it's like I would never buy a computer and not read the manual and try to understand how it works, right? You you buy it, you get a phone and you try to figure out what the new updates are and how to use it. 
we are a computer system. We're actually like the fanciest system there is. You know, we're actually pretty neat. Um, our ability to function, our capacity, our intellect. Why not get to know ourselves and understand ourselves to the best of our ability? Because if not, then we're kind of running into things blind. And sometimes we don't know how to tackle things until we're really in a bad space with it. And that's usually when I see people and it's like they, they're really in a tough space, so thus they're seeking services. Some people are starting to go in a little bit more. Someone used the word earlier of check up. Um, just kind of checking in and tuning in with yourself. Um, in essence, you know, not to sound fatalistic, but we're, we're pretty much alone. Like we have people who love us, we have family, we have loved ones. But in essence, we only know what we think, what we feel on a day to day basis. No one else really does. Um, I don't even really know. My patients know, you know, I know some of what's going on with them. I kind of get to know them and build a connection. But in all reality, we're alone when we are doing things. We are challenged with our own thoughts and with our own barriers. And I think to understand yourself is never a, a bad investment. It's always going to bring you positivity to understand the patients and find out that you guys come in contact with. We'll just help the ability to serve and to be able to finding your self-compassion and understand that humans, we all struggle in some ways and that you need to be able to tune into that at some level and do your work, but also know that there's still a very human component to everything that we do. Um, yes. Now, I don't know what I'm missing from the bullet points, but... <laughs> do you have the copy of this? I have the copy. <laughs> So the basics, and I told you guys a little bit about why I chose it, my background, um, schooling. Yeah, I think I covered a good amount of it. Is there anything like else that you'd like me to cover? I don't know. Before Q&A, yeah. can, can you um, explain some of the differences between like how you can do counseling, right? Because you only like, get an MSW and then end up counseling. You could be an um, LMFT. You could be an LPCC, you could do clinical psychology, like what are those different things and how do you decide which one? So basically, um, I'm not too privy to all of them, to be honest with you, but I would say for the most part, um, the LPCC is a newer one that they're doing, which is a really nice credentialing to get because it's applicable throughout the nation. So MFT, um, you can only do in the state of California. You're licensed in California, you practice in California. If you were to go elsewhere, you'd have to retake the examination or whatever their law ethics guidelines are and do all the process. Maybe not fully, maybe not the 3,000 hours, but I think a certain amount of it and then retaking the exam. Um, so to become licensed, you're licensed here. With the LPCC, you can, that is applicable throughout the nation, which is really nice. And a lot of people who have become licensed end up adding on the LPCC. Um, the social work aspect, because that was something I was curious about, about doing social work or doing just the counseling component. There's actually folks that really go into more of the social work framework of working within um, counseling settings, health settings, and doing case management. Now, the nice part about social work is you get the flexibility to also do therapy, so it's up to you to choose. Um, for me, I can't just choose to do case management. Sometimes there are certain job titles, like for instance, when I worked at the hospital, I did a lot of case management. So we are taught that um, in our schooling, and it can be part of your job description, but with the social work, um, I have a lot of colleagues actually who don't do any case management and just use private practice and social work. So there's flexibility with that one, I would say. Um, you can, there are a lot of different degrees that you can obtain, and um, Aaron mentioned a few of them. And with those, you can go into practicing. There just might be limitations as to having to be under a supervisor um, and the flexibility you get. There are some people that go into doctoral programs, and there's PhDs and PsyDs, and some people tend to do more research-based, and psychologists will tend to do research and testing. And that's something that, for instance, I cannot do testing. I would have to be a, a psychologist and trained in doing testing. That was part of my master's program. I did learn a bit about it, but I'm not credentialed enough to do actual testing. So if I have a client, for instance, and this happens pretty frequently, with a kid that maybe needs testing um, for uh, cognitive deficits in functioning or um, ADHD, ADD, then they'll get referred to a psychologist to get the, the testing component. So there are some differences, um, but for the most part, I think 
all can do counseling. It will just depend on what degree of flexibility. And like I was saying, for myself being licensed, I'm actually a 1099, which is an independent contractor. I work for myself. So if I work for, there can be um, times in which maybe I work for, for instance, the hospital. I'm a, I'm a W-2 under them when I was there as an intern because I was working through them and under my supervisor while I was doing my hours. But once you're licensed and you're working completely on your own. So again, why I was talking about how there's some liability things that you need to be aware of, um, that there's good and bad with it. And actually on a few facets, you also have to learn to save your money because you have to put 30% aside for your taxes. They don't take it out of your taxes for you and all these other things. There's intricacies, but um, yes. Well, before the official Q&A with students, um, I have a question. <laughs> um, could you, if you're okay with it, elaborate on um, something from your upbringing or your own identity and, and personal or family struggles that you had that led you to study what you studied and led you to your career? Um, yeah, that was a big component of why I wanted to do this. So a few things, um, coming to this country, um, we didn't have much support. I think we had one uncle that was here, the rest of our whole network was in Columbia, both mom and dad's side. So it was pretty much my mom, my sister and I. Um, my mom struggling to speak any English, working about like three jobs, um, never home because of it. And so my sister and I kind of Spending for ourselves financially, it was really tough. Um, so economically, we weren't doing too well. And I remember particularly getting um, food from local food bank. And so when I was thinking about, you know, I mentioned earlier, like all the places that we were helped along the way and how much it really meant to us, that I knew I wanted to be a part of that system. Um, and a big reason why I went into working for um, 211, which is a hotline for social services, and I was there for six years because it's a lot of those families looking for food and things and, and a lot of the necessities that they need. So that was one part of it that I really remember and stuck with me. Um, another part is that my mom was really struggling with alcoholism throughout my whole childhood. So she, that was her, unfortunately, unhealthy coping mechanism. She didn't know any better. That was what she did in order to deal with stress and her own life trauma. And it affected us very much so. And I think as a kid, I was really anxious and really fearful. Um, always worried about making her upset because she was really angry. So there was abuse in the house. Um, and I think it's interesting experiencing it, but looking back on it now clinically and, and, and as an adult, I have different thoughts on it. But I would say um, I felt really confused. I felt really alone. I felt really scared. And I didn't know what to do with my emotions about what was occurring, nor did I understand what was really occurring, if that makes any sense. As a child, it's so hard to process these really big adult things and scary things um, with very little support because my dad wasn't really around. Um, so I think that is also a big part of why I wanted to hear myself into helping be a support system and helping people understand the complexities of life and what goes on with them. Um, understanding substance abuse, that was a big thing for me. Um, and also I have traumas. Um, I could go into my whole life story and there is a lot of stuff that happened, but particularly um, I experienced a really bad trauma when I was 13 in an attempted rape. And I think that also, I wish they would have put me in counseling then. But my mom didn't know enough about counseling and didn't understand mental health. And I think um, culturally, there's something we talked earlier about Latinos not wanting to seek out um, counseling because you're not supposed to talk about your stuff to people outside of the family. And sometimes in the family, you don't really talk about your emotions anyway. You just kind of deal with it and move forward. So I think at that point in time, I didn't get the services that I probably really needed. Um, so all of these little things, right? It just kind of added up for me. And I think of course has impacted me, but I think when I went to school, school was my escape and learning was my escape and it was the only way for me to feel powerful and in control and take charge of my life versus feeling really out of control and confused or scared or whatever it might have been. 
So in particular, that's why I knew I wanted to be, I wanted to help people. I wanted to help families. And then I really wanted to learn psychology and human behavior. And I think I got very interested in the way people operate. And anyone who's been through abuse um, knows that you become really attuned to people. You really start to learn people and their behavior and their mannerisms and even their energy and their vibe because why is a protective measure? You need to learn about people in order to protect yourself. So I think in and of itself, I already had a fascination with that and was already in tune and kind of hypervigilant of all of that stuff. And so it's kind of worked well and me working with people with trauma now, I really relate to them. And there's a part of the empathy and compassion I think is just naturally there. So, yes, that's a brief yet not brief description. There's been much more, but yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I'm really, um, really brave. Um, now we can open it up to our students for Q and A. Um, ask us, you know, um, anything about their thoughts or you know your career interests. I have a question, but if you want to, if you want me to warm up with it, or if you have one, I want you to go first. Um, my name is Diana. Um, thank you for coming and sharing with us. Really helpful. Um, I went to be an MFT too, and um, I've grown up with a lot of the fascination that you did in terms of trying to understand how people function and realizing that some people act out in certain ways to defend themselves, and it's just all they've ever known. I was wondering how. Um, you take care of yourself when you hear all of this because I know that um, for a lot of people, um, they don't go into this field because it feels burdens burdensome and it's so heavy, um, especially because um, I'm a very empathetic person. Like, I'll cry before someone else cries if they're telling me their stories. And I just want to know like how um, you bear that weight and how um, you make yourself emotionally feel. Yeah. Um, and I wish I could write about this again because I mm -hmm. find it super fascinating. How do you um, make yourself completely vulnerable and open and connected with someone while setting barriers? It's such a <laughs> dichotomy. It's so tough. It took a long time to be honest with you. I wasn't that good at it in the beginning. Um, and most people that go into helping professions are really empathic people and they are really caring. And so the sensitivity is there. It's just about knowing um, how to monitor that energy that you give and either hold it back or just delineate it in bits. Um, so I guess for me, it took a lot of not doing it right in order to do it right. Um, for instance, when I told you guys about particularly working with children and then trauma um, and batterers and things like that, that's hard to continue your, your feelings about it. Um, it's what I noticed is I guess I noticed what was going wrong first and noticed how much it was impacting my personal life. I think it became really destructive to my own well-being and I would carry on that energy and oftentimes just get really down or stressed out, um, shut down in my personal life. Like I would come home from work and then not be able to talk to, you know, the person I was living with and, and be in a bad mood and all these things. And so. I think it just, um, I noticed that it was impacting me personally and, and interpersonally. Um, and so that's, I think, when I became more aware of it and remembered all that they told me about burnout and about self-care and all these things that they, they tell you in school, you know, my master's program was making and, and talking about these things. And I thought I was aware of it, but then I guess it kind of gets to you sometimes because it's hard not to. And particularly, I guess, why I ended up doing less work with children, to be honest with you. The children aspect was tough because I knew they were going right back into the same dynamic that I could not save them from. And maybe also that was my own counter-transference. So you'll learn what gets to you more. You'll learn your triggers because you have to know yourself. And the whole process of doing this is hopefully uh, an explorative process of you knowing yourself and why they super encourage you even getting help counseling. Um, and you can count your own counseling towards your licensing. Um, they want you to at least do 100 if you can. Because um, that way it doesn't catch you up in, in process and you don't put stuff on people um, and have a bias or, right, there's counter transference and transference. Um, so that stuff as well. But I would say for now, learning how to start to do that, I guess, 
I, I learned that I can only do so much and that my part of it is the best that I can do and knowing that that's okay. Um, it may not save them, it may not change them, it may not help them in any way, shape, or form, but my intent is there and genuine and that that's about all you can do because I wanted to do more. I felt really um, hopeless when I couldn't really save them from the bad situations. Or just so many, so many different stories and things that I've encountered and having even um, patients try to commit suicide, patients passing away from illness, and just a lot of heavy stuff. And I think you have to learn that what you do is hopefully helpful. Um, it's up to them to decide what they do with that information. And, the universe will kind of flow in the way it needs to flow for them, and that's their life lesson, that's the journey. I can't impede on their journey or their decision making. So just knowing those things and keeping that kind of for me to set my limit and then just good coping skills. Yoga was a life favor for me, um, very helpful for my stress. A very good practice to go inward and shut down. It's hard to shut my brain down, to be honest with you. I think people who go into this, you know, they're just constantly analyzing. So knowing that there's a time and place to do that and there's a time and place to have fun and put that aside and be with family and friends and just enjoy your life. Because if you um, you can't give what you don't have. And if you're not in a good space, you're not giving good energy to people. So you have to be really mindful of keeping yourself in check. So you're consistently keeping an eye on everyone in your caseload and making sure they're well, but you have to add yourself to that caseload, I guess, and make sure that you're doing all the things that you tell people to do. Also speaking to people about their coping skills and their self-care is a Reminder for me to make sure that I'm adhering to that because I don't want to tell someone you should do this when I'm over here not abiding by that. So, part and partial of your experience that you'll learn. And it'll be different for you than it is for me. Everyone is so different. But just keep some of those things in mind. Yeah, and really know what populations, people, situations might be bigger triggers for you that might be part of the deal. Office that with your supervisor. Um, so you're a double thing. Yes. <laughs> um, can you tell us more about how you chose your graduate program here and what that experience was like going to grad school here? Um, to be honest with you, the one here, particularly for counseling with T, has a pretty good rep. Um, and I was already super involved in my undergraduate through character and conflict and with a lot of the professors and became um, involved with some of the counseling professors at the master's program and really encouraged me to just look into it. Um, I honestly, I didn't look elsewhere. I loved my experience here so much that I didn't compare and contrast per se. Um, for me, I know a lot of people who ended up doing private colleges and all of this, their debt was crazy. Is crazy. They're still really um, very much in debt. For me, I really liked um, that this is such an amazing commuter school, that the tuition is doable. I know it's hard, but it's doable compared to other private schools for master's programs. And I just knew that I really believed in the faculty here. I think I had such a good experience in my undergrad that I knew the, the, the faculty and I had heard a lot about them and met some of them um, through networking stuff that I was curious about. And so, um, it was just, I don't know, I didn't, it was a no-brainer. I just wanted to do it. I wanted to continue being here. I liked school. Um, but there's a lot of different schools and a lot of different programs. Um, a lot of people went to um, APU, um, Biola, and um, Oliver. Or there's, another, there's like a bunch of, there's a bunch of private ones. Um, so I have some, some friends and colleagues that went there. Um, and then I struggled with the notion of doing master's or a PhD study program and all of that too. But I think taking into consideration money and time because I supported myself throughout my undergrad, worked full time, supported myself throughout my master's, worked full time while doing four classes in the master's program and, and traineeship. It was crazy to me. So I was like, okay, um, I didn't want to do more. For me, it was just the right fit to, to get my license and I wanted to do the master's for sure. Um, and then Okay. <laughs> I feel like a sponsor for this one. That's a, it's a great program. So when you talked about your self care and, and doing yoga, um, that was that in your during your career, right? Yeah. Um, how about like getting through school and getting through your life pressure? Yeah. What did you do? 
So my self-care was not that great, to be honest with you, very particularly my master's program. I a lot of weight, was just not happy, very stressed out, and I think it was legitimately due to, like I said, it was um, time constraint. Um, I did not have enough time. I was doing four classes. Um, when I probably should have done three, um, and I was working full time, and then also trying to do a traineeship, so it was just crazy making. I wouldn't suggest that people do that. If you can, do not do that. Um, but I, you know, I guess when you're young, it, it, it's doable. Um, now I look back on my phone and I'm like, oh no way, I can't do that now. Um, I would say there has to be balance, making enough time for being on campus as well as you're studying and all these things. Um, Procrastination is a big thing that happens, and I think that tends to be a killer for stress. I see that in patients all the time where students are complaining about that. Um, so making sure that you a lot, I think it's a time management thing, I think it's a life balance thing, that you are able to make sure that you have time for all things. For myself, I honestly, I'm not going to lie to you, I was not good at it. I did not have too much time. I tried to do the best I could, um, and then I ended up piling on more stuff. Um, yeah doing case of stuff and other <laughs> extracurricular things that I probably had no business doing. Um, so I would say be mindful of it. Just because I would say I would do that differently now if I if I didn't have to financially struggle so much because I want I wish I would have been able to sit with and take in the information a little bit more. Especially being in private practice, you think back to school and you think back to your licensing like what is the rule? What is what am I supposed to do? What is the you know legislation on this? And, it's hard to to think back and, and really sit with that information if you were go, 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 and going through it so quickly. So my biggest suggestion is really be present with what you guys are going to be doing and really absorb it to the best of your ability. Yeah. I have just a follow-up with that, and mm -hmm. that was one of my questions. Is anyone helping you with your private practice on like the business end and so the private practice, the first one I went into was, it was, you know, man, fine, you do your own thing, and I had no one to talk to about it, and just have to do a lot of research, and I'm trying to talk to the colleagues that were open. There might be settings of which your colleagues are meeting, and where they're not. The first setting I was in, it was terrible, and it was, everyone was really, really competitive, actually. So that was hard. Um, so in that setting, no. The place on that now, um, the company itself, really does everything for you. So one thing, let me explain the difference too. Private practice, you can do, you can set up shop. If you're licensed, you can set up shop, and this is Christine's Counseling Center, right, if you want to. But just know that you are a business owner, and you're taking care of all of the business portion of it, which means if you're taking insurance patients, you have to get on insurance panels, which is not an easy fee. You have to make sure that everything is paid for the overhead for the place itself, um, all of your liability, legal things, you have to get liability insurance. Um, so there's many facets to it, right? Or you can join in on a private practice that's already existing. So someone's doing all of that stuff for you. What you end up doing is you pay a percentage of what you make. Usually it's a 30-70 cut. Um, and then with that pay, that 30%, it takes care of your office space, materials, marketing, um, whoever takes the intakes and sets things up, the systems that you guys use. Um, the technology right behind it. Um, so the place I'm at is amazing and they take care of all of that in a really great way and they're super supportive. Um, we at our place um, do weekly uh, consultation groups. So every Wednesday we get together for two hours, everyone checks in on how they're feeling what they're doing personally and then they get to talk about any cases that they are stuck with or struggling with emotionally or whatever it may be just to get feedback from their colleagues and get a different perspective. So my place right now excellent in that. Um, there are other places that do not do that at all, and you don't have anyone to talk to. You go a whole day, see, sometimes I would see 10 patients work 12, 13 hour days, and have a lot of things come up throughout the day, and I have no one to talk to. So sometimes I would contact old um, friends from school, um, and other colleagues that I had before that were super supportive, and what do you think about this? What should I do about this? Um, and, and find my own network, and then I created one with a group of friends, and we'd get together and talk to them. And talk about these things. Um, so, I guess if you're picking a place of work, once you guys are all done with whatever you do, make sure that there it's a really supportive environment and that there is things set up that can be helpful. Um, the whole business side is a whole other piece of all of this, which is part and parcel of the license too. Now that's good. Just 
questions from the students. Not to like put you on the spot, but we want you to be able to hear um, from Christina. We do all this for you. <laughs> so whatever is on your mind as far as like, what do you need to succeed as an undergrad or a future graduate student or a future health professional or with your own mental health? I mean, she probably won't do a session for you right now, but, <laughs> you know, um, definitely you would use of, uh, this opportunity to ask a question. So apply to a, a grad program like an M MST, do you have to have a human service undergrad or like bachelor's degree next to it? I don't think they're very specific. A lot of people had human services, psychology, but I did find folks that were actually from some non-related um, undergrads, um, communications, I would say, and other things. So maybe if it's applicable in some bridging gap, there might be classes that need to be done. Usually people do it because the classes kind of are in line with what needs for the qualifications for it. But um, not always need to check. And I'm sure each program is different on what the qualifications are, um, what they need as far as the application process. But it can, it can vary um, here on campus for sure with human services and then psychology for the two, the two big ones that we have here. Emily put together a, a group. Yeah, do you have you seen the linkage um, sorry, prereqs? Mm -hmm. We have them in the, in the office. Let's see if we can put it up here. So we do have handouts for each of the linkage partners that we have um, connections to, like what their GPA minimum is, like how many letters of recommendation they require, as well as uh, a list of the prerequisites, or at least the link to what the prerequisites are. So, so it's also on TT. What is that for the linkage? Mm -hmm. um, so, each linkage partner kind of has their own relationship with us, but at a minimum, what they do is agree to help educate our students on what their their field is about, right? So um, each month, we have a professor come out to do a mock graduate and case of grad school um, session so we can get a sense of, okay, like, this is what to expect if you're going into a graduate program in this field. We also have the alumni guest speakers come out who have gone through those programs to kind of highlight. So this is what you could do if you get this degree. We also have them um, uh, send us current graduate students so that um, we know what they're going through as current grad students. Um, so that's kind of all on the education side. Um, when it comes time to actually applying, um, we do have an agreement that they will at least take another look at our applicants. We mean a lot when there are like 500 people applying to one program, right? Um, so part of it is that they know that we've been working with you to prepare you for graduate school. So even though maybe you don't have like a 4.0 or something like that, right? Like they, they know that you know what to expect in graduate school and that we have been preparing you this. Um, another, another thing that we do, um, we just did it for the first time this summer, is a pre-matriculation program. I know it's a big mouthful, but basically it's four weeks before you start the graduate program, and it's very intensive as far as writing prep, research prep, um, and learning about the additional resources that are available here um, for graduate students. And so um, this past summer, it was mostly MSW students, um, and the person in charge of the MSW program said that he's heard that students really benefited from it as they're going through their first semester. We've heard from them directly that you know they're probably the most confident out of their group of uh, out of their cohort because everyone else is like, oh, I wasn't really ready for this. <laughs> so um, those are some of the different ways that we interact with our with our graduate partners. With that, um, let's give Christina another round of applause. Are there any more though? 
Did everyone grab food also? Make sure you grab food if you didn't on your way out. Make sure to sign in and sign out. And let's give Christina again a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, guys, for having me.